tae tu a ste mi taku e pi. Le o tu ha wa ste wi e macha pi. Na wa zi a ha ha eto wa hi. He mak pi a luta o ti pi eto wa hi. Na le cha le mini luza. He sa pa el wa na wa manietu ota wa ti. Na le hao central high school hel wa kaja teacher wi cha wa ye. Mi taku e pi kita ti a le o hina si pi ki. Wo pi la tanka e pi kite. Chante wa ste a na pe chiu sa pi. Oshi malapie le wa hina si na wa che wa ki kite. Ho, ina si pe. Please stand up. I just want to go ahead and sit down. Um, I just want to tell something. It's a protocol. I have to tell. I, this is the way it is. In the Lakota way that I tell about myself. I, um, my father's name is Owen Brings. And due to complications from being in World War II, he passed away at a young age. And uh, we're from the... We're from Pine Ridge and in between there, the Red Cloud community and uh, Slim Buttes. And I lived there. I survived there right there on the reservation. And my fa father died and, uh, when I was only 18 years old. And I had little brothers and sisters. And uh, we had to do a lot. My mother was a single parent and we survived. We survived through all that. My mom knew how to take care of us. My mom's name is Celeste Clown Horse. She's from the uh, old man afraid of his horses, Tioshpae. Those are her family, and I have family all over the reservation. We're the bull bears, the young mans from Oglala, <clears throat> the red stars, Aunt Nelly, two bulls, the black sheep, and the black sheep family. And um, it's just a big family. But I grew up, and it just, it just, really something how I had a grandmother, a great grandmother who was Cheyenne, and she used to tell me, Takoja, they lived in the log house, and she used to say, Takoja, you better go to school in Lakota, because she didn't speak, she didn't speak um, English. And she said, Takoja, in Lakota. She said, Takoja, you better go to school. Why yeah, yeah. Because someday, in the future, you will work with that white man. And at the time, I was only like eight years old, and I thought, yeah, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go to work with this white man? She foreseen the future. She foreseen something that I didn't even understand and realize. But I grew up on the reservation, but I knew there was something out here. I was very curious. I wanted to know what they were doing out here. And I did. The day after I graduated high school, I left. And I went to school at Shattern State. And I went on, always looking, always looking for something, something better. I never knew that I would end up at Chesapa, the sacred land of the Lakota. Beautiful place. As a Lakota, we go in there. And I've been Sundancing since I was 19 years old. I'm still gonna, I still Sundance, and I'm gonna Sundance again. And it, I stopped counting the years. And my uh, grandmother said, you never count the years of you dancing or anything. It makes me feel good. I, am, I teach at the Central High School. I teach Lakota one and two and the Native American heritage. And these are the kind of things I teach my students, natives and non-natives, and I tell them, Let's all get along. Spread the love. Let's try to live together. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to be angry. I want to teach these kids that we can live together. I'm a part of the groups in town here, I think all of them, that is trying to break those barriers <laughs> to make things work. And I'm not going to stop. If I see you and if I remember your face, I will say, hello, do you remember me? Because that's me, that's my personality. I shake hands and I hug everybody. I always feel like the mayor, and Carl, everybody are my relatives. Hey, come here. <laughs> but you know what? They treat me good. They treat me very good. And in Lakota way, we say we're all related. And we have a medicine wheel with the four colors in it the black, the red, the yellow, and the white. 
And we were told a long time ago by the elderly, our elders and our ancestors, that these were the symbols of the races of the world. How could we be fighting? How could we utter ugly words to each other? We've survived millions of years. You know what? And I, I, I spoke nothing but Lakota when I went to school. But I turned around and I had to learn the English language. And um, I think I've mastered it. <laughs> I, I, I think so. So I just want everybody here to, if you're non-native, come and talk to me. Come to my classroom. You will see a beautiful classroom. All these native kids, I try to teach them where they're from. Don't be fighting. Don't be angry anymore. And I try to tell them we all have to get along. And this is right here at Central. Thank you. Pila Moyapi. Good evening. I'm Mayor Steve Allender. And uh, I loved listening to that just now. Uh, welcome. Uh, I think we are all in for a treat tonight. Uh, there's been a little bit of nervous anticipation about this, I know, from the research team, and uh, I'm sure for a few other folks. Well, let me assure you, I have seen the preview of this presentation. Uh, I know the origin of this information, and you'll know it too in just a matter of minutes. Uh, there's no room, no reason for controversy over this issue tonight. And when you leave here tonight, you will not have all the answers. Uh, this is not an end. This is not the conclusion. This is the beginning. And uh, so if you're like me and you will go home with many more unanswered questions and your mind is spinning, uh, just let me tell you that that's going to be normal tonight. Uh, there's a lot of information here, a lot of information that many of us uh, don't understand, don't know. Uh, and whether you're native or non-native, I think we're all going to learn something tonight. I'm proud of all of you for being here. I've, I've never been to an event where this many people have been early. Uh, and all those, uh, all those uh, folks that came on time are going to have to come back and listen to another day. But uh, I know there's another date scheduled. I believe that uh, if there are uh, uh, more people then we can accommodate next time. I think we should have another and another and another session. Uh, it's very rare to get this many people in one room, and I think if, uh, if you've got what it takes to come out from your homes and be here tonight for this, then we should have what it takes to continue to present this until everyone has had an opportunity. I'm very excited about tonight. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you, and uh, so welcome. And I have to just tell you, uh, working with these folks over the last several months, I've grown to uh, uh, respect them a great deal for the work and the time and the blood, sweat, and tears they put into this research and this presentation. And Karen Mortimer and uh, Kibby and Heather, I mean, this is, a, this is the dream team uh, to bring this type of topic to our community. And I couldn't be prouder to have uh, been alongside of them this, uh, uh, for this project. So uh, thank you again for being here. Good evening. Uh, thank you, each and every person who showed up tonight, made a decision to come and learn about something that um, could possibly change things in Rapid City. At the very least, we're going to learn something new and learn to sit alongside with others. Um, I wanted to begin by saying that I'm really, we are truly humbled to be able to bring this information. Many people in this room have so much knowledge, and so I would acknowledge that as we begin. So thank you to all of you, um, and thank you to Harriet for getting us started on the right, um, off, the, off on the right foot. It's also been a real pleasure to partner with the, with the mayor. Um, somebody said, well, is he, is he all in on this? I said, he is more than all in. He's, partnered with us for months 
maybe a year we've been working on this. So I'd like to just give you just a few uh, short thoughts about the Minnelusahan Okolokichiape ambassadors. So I, I guess my name is Karen Mortimer, and I'm the director of the Minnelusahan Okolokichiape ambassadors. In Minnelusahan, Rapid City, Okolokichiape, Circle of Friends ambassadors. So the Minnelusahan Okolokichiape ambassadors, Rapid City, Circle of Friends. It's a group of native and non-native leaders who have come together to um, learn together, to, we, we believe, there's two things we always say. We always say that history and place matter. Tonight, you'll really see that coming to light. We also say that relationships matter. Because it's not just history and place, it's, place, it's about relationships. Our group is 50% Native American, 50% non-Native American, and we've learned things and walked uh, the road over about three years now in amazing ways, and we're very, very, I personally am very grateful for that. Uh, we have a, an acronym called BEAM, and it means Bridging Cultures, Educating Ourselves and Others, Advocating and Modeling Respectful Behavior, and I think tonight is a great example of that. So thanks to all the ambassadors and everyone who's supported this. So tonight we want to set a tone, a tone to establish and strengthen relationships in our community because we truly are stronger together. We want to set a tone of peace as we're working through conflicts and respectful curiosity when we're seeking understanding and also sitting down and, and trying to solve problems with one another. And truly, as I think Harriet brought up, a tone of celebration. This is an ex we have an incredible culture in Rapid City, native and non-native. So if we can come together and celebrate that, what a, what a gift that would be for our community as a whole. So through activity and action, our group, we believe we're seeing <laughs> changes. There's a movement happening. It's not just with us. There's other things going on in Rapid City, but there's a change happening. Carl Jagerus always says that it brings up the seventh generation. So may we celebrate that. To find out more about our uh, project, we have a brand new website, uh, moarapidcity.org. So check it out. We'll have it up later. So we hope you can come and learn more and get involved with us. So tonight, I am so honored to um, have worked with Heather and Kibby. I'm so dry. I need to grab it. <laughs> yeah, where's your water? To, I'm so sorry. Okay. To, to give them a proper a proper uh, introduction, I need some water. <laughs> Who knew that there'd be that many, this many people here tonight? We certainly didn't. <laughs> clearly, it has been an honor and a privilege to work with uh, Heather Don Thompson and Kibby Conti for the last year and a half. We started this just with a seed. That, I didn't start it with it. They have, they've been doing this remarkable research and have learned things far beyond uh, that, uh, anything I knew. But we knew together that we needed to share this with the community. So it's my pleasure to introduce them to you tonight. Heather Don Thompson uh, is a local Harvard Law attorney in our community. She is a volunteer researcher on this project, and she's also enrolled in this Cheyenne River tribe. Kibby, Kibby Conti is also a community volunteer, has volunteered her time. She has very deep roots in this community, and she will share some of that with you this evening. By trade, she's a dietitian, and she's enrolled in Oglala Lakota, the Oglala Lakota tribe. So it is my true honor to introduce you to two of the most remarkable women I've been working with in the last few years. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to test. Can you hear? Okay, good. I'm just going to set this down. Okay. All right. All right. Oops. Go back. Go back. Okay. Um, it's so good to see so many people here. It just shows how important this topic is. This is a very important story that, okay, okay. Let me just pull this up a little bit. 
Is that better? <laughs> okay. I'm just saying it's so glad to see so many people here. And this topic is very, very near and dear to so many people. This story has been told, but I, I think um, to see it all pulled together as a timeline is what we hope to share. It's, I just want to um, acknowledge the elders in the room. And many of the elders have shared a lot of the information with us. And they have more to share. And so at the end, we want to invite anybody that would like to share more. Um, we have um, Eric Zimmer here. And we have Arlo Ironcloud. Arlo, could you stand up? And at the very end, they are going to be taking some of your histories, um, I think, possibly in the room back there, right? OK. OK, great. So just stick around if you if you'd like to share more. There'll be other opportunities. Like I said, we're going to offer this in two weeks. And we would like to do a talking circle prior to the next one. Maybe at 5 o'clock, we need to arrange the place. But we'll get that information out. Um, so let me just get started then. Um, all right. Many of you saw the insert in the journal yesterday, which included this cover photo of the Rapid City Indian School, which opened um, in 1899. Um, at the time, um, the government policy was assimilation. And they, they I'm going to quote that, assimilative schooling was the solution to the quote unquote Indian problem, said the Commissioner on Indian Affairs um, back in the day. The Carlisle Indian School was the model. And so they chose to open up 27 off-reservation schools modeling that. And the pioneer of, of Carlisle was quoted saying, to kill the Indian and save the man. And so it was, it was about um, um, transforming Native people into, into non-Native people. This is a quote from Luther Standing Bear, who attended Carlisle. Did not occur to me at the time that I was going away to learn the ways of the white man. My idea was that I was leaving the reservation and going to do some brave deed and then come home again alive. If I could just do that, then I knew my father would be so proud of me. That's Luther Standing Bear. Um, pictured in here, you can see where the children arrived um, by train to these schools. And of course, um, they, were, uh, they took their clothing away. They um, cut their hair short and replaced it with uniforms. Um, the boys and girls were organized into platoons and companies with student officers who marched them about campus. Um, the use of the Indian language was forbidden. And um, um, Christianity was, um, was taught as well as English. Trades such as farming, sewing, domestic sciences. And so it was a very harsh experience that went on for 100 years, 100 years of boarding school. This is one of my own family photos. This is the only grandmother my father knew was Mary. Uh, Mary Saunders White Russell, and these are her daughters. Um, and at the time, there's, there's nothing she could do um, to stop her children from being sent away to boarding school. It was nearly impossible, because if, if you did try, the, the police would actually come and take your children and, and, and put them in school. Or they would even take your rations away. My grandmother went to this school. Um, Julia Maga, or Russell Maga was my grandmother, born in 1892. And she attended the school um, around 1903. Sadly, her brother died at the school in an explosion in the boiler room. And that was when she was uh, um, taken out of the school. Uh, here you can see the aerial view of what West Rapid looked like. The reason there was so much land, 1,200 acres acquired, was because it was a self-supporting school. So it had a dairy barn, it had a horse barn, it had fields of corn and potatoes down in the floodplain. And so the children, the entire time the school was open, worked half a day and went to school half a day. And, and that's how it operated. The kids typically arriving were in fourth grade, um, and they went till eighth grade. Later on, they extended it to 10th grade. Um, but it was, um, it was definitely a hardship. My grandmother, we have a written interview, um, or a typed interview, that's archived at the university. And she describes how difficult the food was for her. She, she grew up with traditional foods. She said, when we went to boarding school, they fed us boiling beef and bread, boiling beef and bread. It was a very monotonous diet. And it didn't have much um, 
you know, milk or dairy or, or fruits and vegetables, and so she really missed that. But the children would frequently supplement their diet, and actually that's how her brother died. He was supplementing his diet with what they could harvest from the fields, and they would parch corn, and they would put potatoes in the boiler room, and they would supplement. And sadly, that day he, he was there when it exploded. So, okay. Christianity was, again, um, part of the assimilation process, so they had a chapel on the school. And fortunately, we had an elder who approached us with a yearbook from 1924. And it was such a treasure to see that with all the images. And this is one of the photos, the graduating class. And the little girl that was pictured when I said this, my family photo, she's in here. She's um, Margie Twist at the top row, um, second in. And so she, she, she graduated and went on to high school. So this was the eighth grade graduation. Then they had to go to Rapid City High School and board, become a boarder. And she became a teacher later on, going to the teacher college in Spearfish. Um, so the kids came from the various um, Lakota, Dakota reservations, the Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne, Shoshone, Arapaho, so from four different states. Um, my grandmother actually sent her children to this school. So her, my aunts and uncles attended the Rapid City Indian School. Um, and my auntie is actually pictured in here on the upper um, left. And you can see this is the intramural sports. Now the school had undergone some reforms um, in the 20s and actually had become a much better school. They talked about being able to um, eat more and eat better, that the food um, really improved. And they had intramural sports exchanges with other teams that the School of Mines um, assisted with. They could wear their personal clothing. They had a um, band and debate club. And so it was much like some of the public schools where they had similar offerings. But sadly, what we've learned is that at least 40 to 50 children died while they attended the school. And Heather um, did some painstaking research with an assistant to find the microfiche uh, records of the children who did pass on. And you can see how difficult it is. These records are not um, over with age. They haven't really maintained their integrity. And so um, sometimes we just have to say it's illegible. But these are the ones that we, um, to date at least, um, know of. And the ones with the asterisks are actually buried at Mountain View Cemetery. And then the others, um, we have some suspicion that there, there might be an unmarked cemetery that's um, just near Sioux San, but it's um, um, in the process of being protected. This actually was very sad um, that we learned through this that Mabel Holy was actually buried at Mountain View, and sadly her family has been looking for her and where, what happened to her. And you can see where they wrote the school asking the superintendent and he, he replied that he could not find where she was buried. But here, the family's been contacted, and um, it's a very emotional experience for them to, to know where their loved one is now. So, And that's our hope, similar to what the Cheyenne River Sioux has erected, um, a, a beautiful marker, that we, we ultimately will be able to also um, have a memorial, a stone, and also to remember those who passed on at least annually, and that's what we've been advised by our spiritual advisors, that once a year we need to remember all those who died at the school in the TB era. The school closed in 33. These off-reservation boarding schools, the government decided um, really weren't working very well and um, closed them. And the Civil Civilian Conservation Corps, and um, I had a typo in the newspaper, it's Civilian Conservation Corps, um, did occupy the land. Uh, uh, the families, not just the men, but their families. And we've had elders come back and remember and tell us stories about that era. Okay, so the TB epidemic was really um, impacting Indian country in the 30s. So we had um, more and more people in the schools coming down with TB and um, to, to, to control it and pre do some prevention and treatment, they, they opened a TB sanatorium in 1939. Um, this is what the campus looked like. They still had the, the dairy barn and the horse barn, and they were still using some of the land as a farm. 
one of the best um, details about this era is, is actually from a book that was published by Marc St. Pierre, or written by Marc St. Pierre, Madonna Swan, Swan Story, and it's a compelling story of, of that era. She is a survivor, and she's pictured on the right here. Um, she survived for seven years at the sanatorium, and it's, it's just incredible, all the death that she witnessed on a nearly daily basis. And I know my father was a patient there as well, and he describes that the hearse would come and take the dead away on an almost daily basis. So it was, it was a very tragic, dark time in the history. Um, her story of survival is just remarkable. She actually had to leave in order to survive. She was told she only had a short time to live, a matter of weeks, and she fled. She didn't want to die there. And in fleeing, her father demanded an audience with the governor of South Dakota and asked her to be cared for at the white sanatorium called the Sanator in Custer. And sure enough, it was the Sanator that saved her life. They did a radical surgery to removing her diseased lung, and they gave her um, some newer medications, and she was able to survive. Okay. Um, we really need to credit the women in our community historically were the ones that were really had the liberty to advocate and to promote services and to organize. And so it was the women really who helped to start our need of churches, Indian education, legal aid, and even how we got our current hospital because the TB era was coming to an end in the 60s but there was such a growing, emerging Native community that needed health care. And they would turn you away if you showed up at the regular hospitals because they said, you have to go back to the reservation. Well, the women um, really did the research and helped to get, in 1966, funding for our current um, clinics in the hospital. So here's another beautiful photo of the Unchis and advocating. Um, this is actually one of my... This is the same Margie Twist that we've seen three times now. Now she's a patient in clinic and um, receiving care at, at the PHS hospital. So there concludes um, uh, my, my story of the history um, of the school era. And I would like to pass the mic. Okay. We're going to do questions at the very end. So. Thank you so much for being here. We are so delighted to see so many of you. You never know when you throw these sort of things, especially when it's nerdy history, how many people are going to show up. So we are delighted to have you here. Um, OK, might have to help me set this up, too. Here we go. So Kibby always gets to do the fun part. There we go. Kibby gets to do the fun part, and she has beautiful photos, and she gets to tell the stories, and then I get to come on and be really nerdy. So I object to that, but I don't seem to have any say. So um, as Karen said, and you guys uh, cut me off when we have like 15 minutes left, so we make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, how did we, everybody's like, why did you start reading, you know, why did you start researching this? And there are many of you, how many of you guys are sort of familiar with this story? Great. So a lot of us have heard about this in the past, and when I moved back into town, maybe 10 years ago, I heard a lot about it too, but it was always incomplete. And someone would say, oh, this is where the boundaries are, this is where the school was, this is what happened here, and it was always inaccurate or incomplete. And Kibbe, around the same time, was collecting information for the 75th anniversary of Susan. And the elders were coming to her and saying, what are you going to do about the graves? And we thought, oh, we should probably do something about the graves. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm a lawyer. I can go down and just look up these documents. And so that is the impetus for this original research about four or five years ago. It was just to help find the graves for the elders, locate where we thought they might be. And um, we opened a Pandora's box, right? And so welcome to Pandora's box. So as Kibby said, um, this, it was originally a school. Everybody know where Susan is? OK, that's where the school was. And then it became a, a TB clinic. Um, while it was still a TB clinic, things changed. We wanted to make sure you knew the history of it, though, so you could understand the emotional attachment to that land, right? A lot of families, a lot of kids there. How many of you guys read the insert in um, yesterday's paper? Okay, so you saw the waves of migration, right? Coming, the modern waves of native migration coming to Rapid City. After the native community was largely moved to the reservations, there were 
at least several modern migration patterns. One was when the children were taken and brought to the school. A lot of people came and lived near their families to be closer to their children lived along the river. A second wave was when it was a TB clinic and a lot of people came from the reservations to be near their families. It was a, it was a segregated TB clinic. The non-native TB clinic, as you probably know, was in Custer. <clears throat> so a lot of the native families came here. And then the third wave was during World War II when um, the Arm, no, Air Force made a bombing range out of part of the Badlands of Oglala. So you had a lot of families coming and living along the river that didn't have permanent housing, but to be near their family that was over on the west side in Susan. <clears throat> so around the same time, after World War II, um, there was a lot of pressure for population growth, right, in Rapid City. And the city wanted to move westerly. So let's see if we can figure this out. All right, does that little pointer work? So this is uh, from the Rapid City Journal from 1948. May 11th. So you can see the National Guard, the schools, the city, the Catholic Church, they went to Congress because this land was owned by the federal government to run the Indian school and got a special law passed in order to obtain access to those lands. The reason why this is relevant from a historical perspective, this specific um, document, is what is the date on this? May 11th, 1948. Okay? What is the date up here? This is the day the law actually became public. Okay, so, so those decisions were probably made <laughs> ahead of time. So this was a, a, this was a lot of what was going on behind the scenes before it became public. So this is the actual law. It's a little difficult to read, right, in small text, so I have it summarized for you guys. And essentially what the law says is the federal government through the Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, has authority to do three things with those, that 1,200 acres, 12 to 1,400 acres. Um, there's 12 to 1,400 acres and two springs. Claycorn Springs, everybody know where the fish hatchery is? Okay, so those all belong to the school to educate natives. Um, so the section one is that the land can be granted for free uh, to the city of Rapid, to the school district, or to the National Guard um, with a reversion clause. So since it was a land grant, each of those deeds contains a provision that says when you're no longer using it for the school or school district, the city, or the National Guard, it reverts back to the Department of Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs. The second section allowed land to be sold in fee for a reasonable value to churches. Anybody ever notice there's a lot of churches on West Rapid? This is why. And then the third section, um, and this is sort of the nomenclature at the time, needy Indians, the land could be used for quote unquote needy Indians, it could be used itself for needy Indians or it could be traded for needy Indians. So what we're gonna do tonight in this last part of the presentation is walk you through what happened to those lands, where they were allocated, and then we'll answer any questions you might have about it. So these are the original 1,200, 1,400 acre boundaries, more or less. Thank you to the Rapid City Journal for helping me do this. As you know, you, now my technology's not so great. Um, there were actually three acts. The one we're mostly focusing on is 1948. There were two small acts where individuals went to Congress and got special laws just for them. <laughs> um, one was the, you know this little corner, there's parking lot across from the Catholic Church at Canyon Lake? And then the Dairy Queen, right there. <laughs> it wasn't for a Dairy Queen at the time, I don't think. I'm actually not 100% sure why that law was passed. I think it might have been railroad right-of-ways, but I'm not 100% sure. And then the National Guard went and got a special trade, a special law to trade this land for Camp Rapid. So these A, these two little corner sections in B, were all owned what's called in fee. That's nerdy legal talk, but anybody own a house here? Right, okay, so you own your house, your land in fee. You own it personally. It's not owned by the federal government. There's no restrictions on it. So there's no restrictions on those pieces of land. And then everything else we're talking about, from Mountain View Road to Canyon Lake to the training camp, all fell under this act of 1948, okay? So you can see, before I go into the detail, you can see what's here. These are houses, right? Anybody live here in those houses? Okay, you're fine. Don't panic during this, okay? <laughs> All 
All right, summary of recipients. Section one, cities, schools, and National Guard with the reversion clause. The title to any land so conveyed shall revert to the United States when land is no longer used for these purposes. What's that? Are you okay? All right, so here's how these lands were allocated. And when we get to the end, I'll actually show you the dates of allocation if any of you are interested in that. But these are just gonna be summaries. So the city of Rapid received land for Sioux Park. So how many people love Sioux Park, like me? Yeah, so that is a beautiful gift from the boarding school. Um, West Middle School, which we'll talk about a little bit more. It's kind of an interesting situation. Um, and the Rapid City School District, anybody here from the school district? Okay, so you got Canyon Lake Elementary, West Middle School, and Stevens High School. So don't give it away, because it has a reversion clause, okay? The National Guard, that entire giant 600 acres for the training camp is all Indian boarding school land. Okay, the second section, the churches may receive the land, um, I'm sorry, may buy the land for a reasonable value. The initial draft of the statute actually gave the churches the land for free and, um, and objections were raised with the separation of church and state. So it had to be sold to the churches. The reason why this became a little controversial, okay, so this letter was written in 1982, and I think Kibbe sort of mentioned, and if you read in our handout, the Native community has sort of been raising concerns about the land for quite some time. Um, so this is a letter from 1982 from Eva Nichols, Eva Nichols, who was a sort of a leader on this issue. And you can see even way back in 1982, city officials are of the opinion it's a mess. I think that's an official legal term. Uh, churches receive land and have deed. I'm sure the federal government was unaware they would immediately sell such parcels of land and set up a realty business. So I wasn't around during that. I don't actually know how it went down. But we do know that those of you that live in those houses in those areas, those were church plots that were eventually at some point in time flipped um, for housing. The churches purchased those plots in fee, which means what, without restrictions. So legally, you're allowed to do that. But it raised a lot of questions. So you can see the Catholic Church actually, um, the very first recipient of the land was Canyon Lake Elementary School, interestingly. But the second recipient was the Catholic Church. So the, the beautiful church right across from Canyon Lake, you can thank the boarding school for that beautiful church, that plot. So they have kept their parcel the whole time. But you can see the parcels that went out to the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church of Sturgis, all sold and became housing subdivisions. And so a great deal of concern was raised about whether or not this was meeting the purpose of the statute, which was that this was to go to churches for religious purposes. So much so that you can see in 1954, the Department of Interior actually, the solicitors, the lawyers for the Department of Interior actually had to issue a formal letter. And it said, you can't do this, you can't give the land away for free, it can't be for nominal dollars, you have to actually sell it at fair market value. And so when that letter came out, seven of the 10 churches that had requests pending withdrew their requests because the prices were substantially more, I can imagine. Um, but there were nine churches in total that did request a plot and purchase the plot. Um, some of them received more than one. And you can see the, the two entities that we could never figure out what were, and maybe some of you guys might know, um, the American Indian Mission received two plots and sort of flipped those right away, but I've never been able to figure out exactly what that was. Um, most of the churches kept their plot or just sold a part of it. So like the Presbyterian Church up there on the corner by Suzanne, and there's another church next to it and some houses now. So, so that was, they kept part of it and then sold part of it. And then the Black Hills Bible School is another entity which I've never been able to totally figure out what that is. And I, I think it might become the John Witherspoon College. But the rest of that whole area by Stevens High School was their plot. You can see they got a very substantial allocation, 34 acres. Okay. And then the third section was needy Indians. Um, Secretary of Interior is authorized in a discretion to utilize any of the lands 
for rehabilitation of needy Indians or to exchange such lands. And this rehabilitation of needy Indians, this is um, kind of New Deal language. This is very common language at the time. So when we first started researching this, um, it was, we noted that there, are, there was no acreage allocated under this provision. Um, and so I initially thought, well, maybe the community didn't know about it. Um, but that wasn't the case. Um, as we went through more documents, there, there were actually dozens of requests um, for access to the land for a variety of purposes. The most substantial was housing, um, which continues to be a struggle um, today. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the, f the first big one, when the, when the native community, remember we talked about there was a three waves of migration and a lot of the, the community members were living along the river downtown. Some of you guys, some of you might remember that. Yeah, okay. So when the land started getting allocated and the community realized that this was an option, a formal request was put in to build native housing near Susan where many had sort of a personal and emotional connection. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a great deal of um, opposition from the community members that were living in West Rapid at the time. There were a number of petitions that were signed and circulated. We did try to find the petitions, we didn't find them. <clears throat> but we found uh, Rapid City Journal reports about the petitions. So that became politically not a good option for the city. You can see they're threatening to, you've got some councilmen in here, you probably appreciate this, threatening to impeach the council people <laughs> if that happens. Um, so this is sort of an interesting land situation that happened. And the reason why we spend a little bit more time on this than some of the other topics is because this has led to a lot of misunderstanding within the native community that has led to, I think, a lot of, of the concerns and issues that we continue to see today. So after the native community requested some land for housing and it was denied, the city of Rapid and the federal government came up with a plan. Neither one of them wanted to sort of take responsibility for the housing. And so the federal government gave the land for West Middle School. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna physically be this transaction because I get confused myself. So I'm the federal government. I gave the land to the city for West Middle School, which is totally allowable under the statute, right? But then the city sold it to the school district for $15,000 which I'm not gonna take a legal opinion on. So then the city took that $15,000 and gave it to the mayor's committee on human rights. I think it's gone through a different, different names on white Indian relations, on race relations. It's all the same committee, but it's a non-governmental committee. So the thought was, okay, now we have sort of both federal government and city government absolved ourselves from, from this transaction. So the mayor's committee, the non-governmental entity, purchased what was then 20 acres way north of Rapid City. Does anybody know where Lakota Homes is? It's north of Lakota Homes. And at the time, there was sort of nothing there, right, in the 50s. So they moved the native community way north of Lakota Homes to what is now called Sioux Edition, was then called Sioux Edition. Um, but there was no water or sewer. So the community members still had to go all the way back to the river and haul water for over a decade. So, so this caused a lot of d feelings within the community because the reason they were told they couldn't be over at Susan was there was no water and sewer. <laughs> so this, this is like important to know so we understand where this comes from, right? Um, and then this was complicated by the fact that for a lot of Native community members on the reservation, when you have federal land, it's trust land, right? And what's unique about trust land versus fee land? Non-taxable, exactly. So because the request by the Native community had been for federal lands, it had been under the assumption the whole time that this had been a one-for-one -one land swap as was allowable under the statute, right, for Needy Indians. But it wasn't, as you can see here. So what happened was most of the community members that had been moved off the river and moved up to Sioux Edition thought they were on federal trust land this whole time and weren't paying any taxes. And so the majority of those families lost their homes. So it's just important we understand that, you know, there's still, does anybody here live in Sioux Edition or 
All right, so we still have people that are living or are from Sioux Edition. So this is very real, right? The, a lot of our community members are descendants of these families. So this is what it looked like at the time. Um, the mayor's committee moved shacks in um, tents out here. You can see they're kind of the only thing out here. <laughs> but this was Sioux Edition in 1955. Okay, so then after the housing request for um, Susan land, so we're going back to where the, school, the boarding school is. So after that housing request was unsuccessful, there were still a number of other requests. So in the 50s, the focus was on housing. That obviously is not gonna happen. So then the focus turned to powwow grounds or cultural grounds. Does anybody ever remember there being powwows over there? Mm -hmm. So that's what that was about, right? But they never actually received the land. So they were allowed to have um, events on it, but they never received the land. Um, and then, much to my surprise, we actually found like reams and reams of plans. The United Sioux Tribes had a whole plan put together for an educational center and putting a tribal college there. The Winona Club actually had um, architectural plans drawn up for a Sioux museum. There were some elders that put together an entire plan for elder housing. <clears throat> And I think that was actually published in the document yesterday. I just thought it was pretty amazing. I wanted you guys to see the care that had been hand drawn on that. Um, so all of these requests were also turned down. And most of these families and their descendants still live in this community. And then most recently, as you know, there's been a push for powwow grounds. Actually, they were talking about building them around here. Um, and then an urban Indian center. I think we're one of the only cities with such a large native population that doesn't have an urban Indian center. So these were all turned down as well. Um, so here's the full timeline. We're almost done. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. Plenty of time to talk. So this is the full time in order of the dates. Just wanted you guys, if some people were curious, they kept asking about that. Oops, there's our map. We'll come back. I'll put this up when we ask questions. So if you guys have any questions, you can refer to the map. So here's the date. The National Guard, remember that was a separate piece of legislation. Then here's the May 20, 1948 legislation, but when was the article? May 11th, okay. So Canyon Lake Elementary School, Catholic Church, Sioux Park, National Guard Range. So the National Guard Range actually used to be much larger and they gifted 90 acres, I think, back to the Department of Interior and then they gifted it for Stevens High School. So that's where that land came from. So then Methodist Church, Lutheran Church, Methodist, West Middle, we talked about that. Interesting arrangement. Um, Bureau of Reclamation, that is now uh, Black Hills Works. Uh, this is when the transfer cut from um, the boarding school to IHS officially happened. Church, 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 Stevens High School. Okay. And then the last two parcels that were left, um, and this, the, so the women, if you guys, did you guys read the article, the very last article that Karen Eagle wrote about the efforts by the women over the years? Okay, so, so the, the very last effort, the women were like, okay, they're not gonna give us the land, so we're gonna get creative about it. Well, you don't have to give it to us. Give it to the Federal Indian Arts and Crafts Board. And so they agreed to that. And the Federal Indian Arts and Crafts Board took possession of the remaining two federal parcels with the intent to build the Sioux Museum on it that these women had been envisioning and planning and working on for so long. And unfortunately, from what we can tell, there was just never any appropriations or sufficient funds raised to actually build that. <clears throat> and so that, the, what was going to be in that Sioux Museum is now here and housed at the Journey Museum, that, those exhibits. Okay. So I know we end and we have so many more questions than we began. Um, but there's a lot of different outstanding issues that we haven't covered. One is obviously collecting additional oops, stories and documents. And again, if Eric can stand up and Arlo in the back, they are gonna take oral histories afterwards in that corner over there. So if anybody has some stories you'd like to share, we would love to collect your stories. Um, lands with reversion clauses. There are, um, as we pointed out in the document, there are um, just a handful of plots that 
are subject to the reversion clause that had questionable transfers. Um, we have met individually with each of those entities. We are not going to talk about it publicly out of respect for them. But we do want you to know, don't worry. If you have never met me before, you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> Um, it does raise a lot of legal issues, but also mostly a lot of equitable issues. You know, how does this shape our city? Like, our city still kind of still looks like this. And certain communities got, you know, some really nice benefits and some certain communities maybe didn't. And how does that shape how we think about how we allocate resources and moving forward? Um, the status of the Sioux addition lands, um, another outstanding question, just a difficult question. I don't think any of us have any answers, but that's really difficult for a lot of families that were moved to Sioux Addition and lost their homes. Um, the, sat the status of water. Um, so as I said, the, the, the boarding school had two springs associated with it, uh, Clayhorn Springs and Big Springs. Um, and we're still sort of researching how that went out of ownership uh, and became a fish hatchery. And then Sioux Addition, um, actually, because they felt it was federal land, uh, used Indian, federal Indian health services, federal dollars, to finally build a water and sanitation services out to those homes. Um, and they owned it. The Sioux Addition Civic Association owned it. Um, and that was one of their questions to us um, as researchers, is what happened to it? You know, we owned it and we, and we don't have an answer to that yet. Um, so as Karen said, on the MOA Rapid City website, uh, we actually put all of the articles that go into much more detail than we went into tonight that were in here. Um, I want to thank everybody that worked on this. We actually, as you can tell, it was not in the Rapid City Journal. We paid for this ourselves. Uh, and we wrote this ourselves because we wanted to be very factual. And we wanted to make sure that you guys got as many facts as we had to help you as a community think through what this means and what your opinion of it was of yourself. But is it fair and balanced? We wanted you to be able to get the information yourself and make the decisions yourself. So that's why we did it this way. Um, so I hope that you found that as uh, informative because we worked really hard on that. So let's go back. To that. All right, now I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Does anybody want to play Oprah? Whitney, you're up. I know that's not your purpose of being up, but All right, so question, any questions? Comments, questions, all right. And uh, when we bring the microphone, if you could introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, and uh, what's your zodiac sign? Marsha Dunsmore, I'm from Rapid City, and I'm a Leo. Um, <laughs> And I follow directions. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, yes. do they still have control over that 111 acres or whatever it was? Um, they do not have control over that anymore. Um, that remaining parcel, can you guys hear me okay without the mic? I'm pretty loud, okay. So that remaining parcel, as I said, the whole reason we started this research was to honor those children that died and to figure out where they were. And we believe that at least one of those parcels is where they are. And so what we did is the last several years before we came to you publicly, we wanted to make sure that that land was protected from ever being sold to anybody else. And so that land is now um, belongs to the tribal community for protection of those graves. Any other questions? This is a no question cry to crowd. All right, name, location, and uh, favorite place to eat. <laughs> Rapid City, Patrick Roseland Colonial House. How's that sound? <laughs> uh, my question is probably a little offbeat, but how does the, the Indian Hospital in North Rapid fit into this? They call it the pest house at one point. <laughs> We're at in North Valley. Those apartments that were just torn down. Yeah, it was torn down, but I'm not sure there's not a whole lot of history about it. I actually don't know. Does anybody in the audience know? It's the Bishop where Episcopal Church was. It was a church. Oh, is it the mother?
Mother Butler predecessor to Mother, Mother Butler? Yeah, it was the Episcopal Church owned it. It was called the Bishop Ware Indian School. And it was kind of up there by where North Middle School is now. Okay. And you can see it in a lot of the old photos. It's like in the distance, way off. And someone will usually write on there, Pest House. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really what you see. But there are some close-up pictures of it. It was a big building, but it's entirely gone. And it was church, so. It was church owned. There's your answer. I like it, audience participation. Questions, way in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Name, location, and uh, favorite bow wow. Hello, good evening. My name is Meyer LeClaire, and uh, my favorite pow wow would say United Sioux Tribes in Bismarck. <laughs> but my question is um, out of curiosity, where is the Big Springs? Located when we talk about water, water rights, you know, it's all this is really amazing. And also, when you talked about the native community members asked for land for housing for the native people, and they're did I get this clarified that they did not want them living up there at the Sioux Sand where all the lands are located, so they pushed them towards. So addition. So let's be clear. None of us in this room had anything to do. <laughs> yes, of course. But I just wanted to get a clarification, only because I do a lot of running on a bike path, and I think about our people with the housing issue here in Rapid City, and if uh, things can move towards, you know, having housing for the native people. So, so two questions. So, so in a different time, in a different era, with different people, yes, there was significant pushback about housing, uh, native housing in West Rapid, and that resulted in the housing going north. Um, the other part of your question, sorry, big springs. Big springs. Um, it's a good question. I don't 100% know. Um, there is not a super great description of them in all the documents that we found, and one of the documents I found says it no longer exists, so I don't know if it, no, if it stopped providing water. Um, I, to the best, my best guess right now is it might actually be what's under um, Canyon Lake, but I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that. We all know where Claghorn Springs is. No, ma'am. Do you know? Yes, ma'am. All right, give that man the microphone. Yes, this is oral history. I, I, I can speak. Big right, spring. right near the big oak tree that is just <laughs> east of the new pump house that the city spring. just built okay. was the big spring mm -hmm. and way and 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 right near mrs claycorn's yeah. original home site which is right near the big oak tree that still stands near the pump house mm -hmm. Are we talking about down here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the Bing Springs got covered up when, in 1964, the DOT cut off the mountain, filled the land up 11 feet, and covered the Big Springs up. But originally, the Big Springs and Cleghorn Springs had a waterway all the way to Sioux Sand sanitarium school and that's where they got their water from which ran through the housing development that is there and some places still irrigate off of that but it has been closed down since the dot covered everything up raised the elevation of the of the flood plain over 11 feet before 1972 this was in 1964 and um, in the uh, Clegg, uh, Canyon Lake or uh, Cleghorn Water Association, I believe, was shut down in about 73, 74. And the original pump station is right at the intersection of Chapel Valley and Jackson Boulevard. And that has all been put underground at that time. My folks moved to Cleghorn Canyon and Highway 44 in 1944. 
Can we get your oral history at the end of this? Because we've had a lot of trouble with the water. I've got more oral history than he's got tape. <laughs> Okay, you're going to speak to Eric when we're done here, okay? But if you have any other questions, <laughs> if, if, if you have any other questions, ma'am? Yes, sir. I have the original abstracts for all of that property, including... You're my new best friend. <laughs> awesome, I love it. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Mark St. Pierre, and I wrote the book about Madonna Swan, and I, I want to give some historic context. I've had a lot of years to think about this. <clears throat> I hope I don't cough. I've kind of got a cold, but when I was researching the book, I found documents in 1918. The United States government sent out a review of all Indian hospitals in South Dakota with the principal concern the high number of, the high number of deaths due to tuberculosis. So in 1918, there were 264 births on the Rosebud Agency, which went from uh, basically Wagner clear all the way over to the edge of Pine Ridge. So on that agency, uh, which include the Yankton Sioux, 264 births and 262 deaths. Most of those deaths, as a relate, were from tuberculosis. So tuberculosis kept the Lakota population grow from growing substantially at all from the beginning of the reservation period until the conquering of tuberculosis with streptomycin in the 1950s, which is really what the Madonna Swan story is about. From the end of the tuberculosis epidemic to today, the growth in the Lakota population has been remarkable and astounding because they weren't dying from tuberculosis. So the conquering of tuberculosis set up the reality today where native people in western South Dakota are by far the largest economic power as a single group of people and the largest ethnic minority. So when all of that happened because of those families that suffered in the sand and those that survived and those that stayed there long enough uh, to demand in the 1950s through an organization called Lakota TB. And Eunice Larrabee from Bear Creek on Cheyenne River was a leader in that organization. And they pressured the government to bring modern medicine into, into Sioux Sand. And it took years of pressuring the government to get the same medicines that were being used in Custer to be used at the sanitarium in Rapid City. And once that happened, Tuberculosis was put, was pushed back, and uh, you know we have a very different situation in Western South Dakota today. So, the tuberculosis plays a huge role in the history of Western South Dakota. I just want people have, to realize that. Do we have the books? Thank you, Mark. We have uh, Kibbe. Do you have those books? Yes, we wanted to show you Mark's book and um, the, also the Rapid City Indian Boarding School book. So that's Mark's book on um, Madonna Swan. And they're both on Amazon. So I just want to point out that it is actually my microphone. And I tell my husband that I'm electrifying all the time. He doesn't believe me. So you guys are my witnesses, and he's here tonight. So it's, it's, my, it's my field. I'll give one plug. If those of you that have never read Madonna Swan, and I'm not saying this because I put it together. It's her story. Those of you that have not read it, that have children and grandchildren who are exploring South Dakota in the future, Read that story because it's a wonderful, triumphant story, human story of triumph. And it's a South Dakota story. It's been compared to Anne Frank, and it's been compared to Little House on the Prairie. But it's available, and I really wish South Dakotans, Lakota and non-Indian South Dakotans would share that book with their young people. Thanks, Mark. We got a question back here? Yes, ma'am. Um, what are the chances, or, or what is the... the possibility or probability of so-called needy Indians or Native Americans to benefit from some of this money if it becomes available. Is there any money that will become available when all of this dust settles and we... If so there's no money affiliated with any of these lands. Mm -hmm. 
Um, these were just uh, land grants, inland sales. Um, what, and like I said, you know, all the land has been allocated now. Um, what becomes of this presentation and this information is up to you as a community members. Um, that's what even, we're even for some of the parcels that were transferred illegally, there, there'd be no reparation from, for that. Be up to the community and, and, the, and the landowners that are aware that there were issues with the transfers. One more question right here and then right there. Carmen Timmerman, Rapid City. Two questions. Um, one, uh, the two infants who died at Sioux Sand, since this was a boarding school and started when the children were roughly in the first grade, um, can you give us any insight into that? I don't know. Um, maybe the audience members might know. Our best guess was that they were children of either people working there or the older children. Um, we actually didn't know about them until we went to the Mountain View Cemetery last week um, and found their headstones. Mm -hmm. and then my second question is, and it's sort of a corollary to this uh, lady behind me, is to next steps. Uh, in addition to your doing your research, mm -hmm. what do you see as some tangible next steps? Um, we've had some amazing ideas and questions. Um, someone from the Rapid City School District spoke about including these books in the curriculum for the senior high schools, which I think is a, an amazing idea. Um, we've had conversations about the city council has um, discussed wanting to help protect the graves and helping us find fencing and maybe even putting it on the city grave roster to help provide them some more protection. So uh, we are hoping that you yourselves as community members will come up with creative ideas after we all learn this information together. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dick McConnell from Rapid City. I think that one's you, sir, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you found these missing graves that you were looking for when you first introduced yourself? Uh, we believe we have. Uh, those were the parcels of lands that we wanted to make sure were in safe protection before we started doing these public presentations. Uh, they are not marked, but um, Kibbe, in her role of collecting information, received numerous oral histories from elders in the community about visiting very sp this very specific location. Um, because they are not protected at the moment, uh, we're not revealing where that is until we are able to better protect those children. Um, but do know it's not under any of your houses. Uh, it is undeveloped land, and it, ha it has been undeveloped this whole time. I, I just want to say, how many of you are going to be able to do this? I want you to talk about this. I want to do, when these questions about Susan, it's always secondhand information or thirdhand information. But I'm talking about first-hand information, and that's me. Susan Hospital, the great epidemics that hit the whole West, but uh, tuberculosis was in Colorado all over. It was a great epidemic. But Susan, I worked there in 1960. And we had people, different native people from all over, and they came there. We had a school there for some of the children that had tuberculosis. We had babies there, babies on the third floor, and they were in little cages because they didn't have enough staff to take care of those children. I remember some of the people that were there, they had to stay there, not just one year, two years, three years for operations. And so that's why I'm here today, to remember them. Because they gave me those moments that I needed to share with you. And those moments became days. Those days became weeks. Those weeks became years. And all that time, what was happening? At Susan, I was going to the University of South Dakota as a freshman, and I had great anxieties about doing all kinds of things. But I had an opportunity to be the janitor there. 
And so what I did is I used to put on a mask and a gown and I'd clean up the, all the rooms. And all the Native people were there, they'd say, look, there's a new Indian doctor here. <laughs> <laughs> and they would tease me. But some of those people that were there, they had aspirations and hopes, just like all of us do today for our grandchildren and for, you know, a better life. And one of the things I remember was that there was a number of little children there that had spinal meningitis. And the nurses didn't have time to take them out of the cages, so I would take them out. And I would play with them. And they said, Art, don't play with them too much, because you'll get spoiled. I said, that's the whole idea. <laughs> but from that, I have known Rapid City. So people always ask, how long has Indian people been in Rapid City? Or how long have you been here? I said, we've been here so long that the dinosaurs turned to stone. <laughs> so we wanted to, in those questions, these questions and what they're doing, is something that should have happened a long time ago, but it's happening now. And it's up to us. All the younger people, your children in school, need to know what their origin is. If a child would go to school, just think, I was used to be the director of Indian education here in the school systems. And we had a great working relationship with, with the police department, the sheriff's department, and we worked together. And we would have an annual bubble, buffalo feed, and people would come in and we would honor them, both native and non-native. We'd give them a medallion saying, for contributing to the education of Indian children. The police department used to pass around cakes. And they said, oh, what is this? But they took part. It was part of their community. Something they needed to step forward. And it was the same sign for the Lakota. Me, I'm a lone wolf. <laughs> I, I had to live on both sides. I had to live on the Lakota side, on the Washichu side. And a lot of the Indian people, or Lakota people and other Native people, they became lone wolves. Because they had to survive in both. They couldn't go to the reservations. There was nothing there. They tried, they built their way. But just being here, all the revenue that is derived from all this went into the Rapid City coffers. All the things that you see every day, the people that hear when they go buy something, when they do something, they contribute to the economic growth. You know, I, I, I say this in the sense that those were in that time was an evolutionary process. We evolved from those. But also we need to have an involution. Because of the, where we live in technology today, but we, where the world is so small, and we as people here, and I look at it and saying, we need to continue in looking and helping one another. American Indian Center, Native American Center, here in Rapid City, used to be one. And it was a place where you could create dialogue. You could create jobs. So I'm saying to you, as relatives, and as friends, and as citizens, you know, right now we look, and in technology, Hubble, the Hubble uh, telescope, we can almost touch the face of a creator. And he's still present today. You know, we, we are the people together have put that 
ability to do that. You know, the other thing is, is that we, we got an A in space if you're a school teacher. You got an A plus. But we can't afford to flunk uh, here on Earth as people. We must carry that in our hearts. When you see Lakota people maybe on the street, I never used to see that in Rapid City. You know, they need to know that. And so look in your heart of hearts. I, I like the gentleman's comment. He said, I can tell you a lot of stories. You need to tell those stories. You and I have both got gray hair. We're not here going to be here that long. <laughs> We need to continue our history and our evolution in the involution. Thank you. What time are we at? We have five minutes, and we promise to start at, stop at eight. So we'll do this question, two questions. And then um, we will, as a panel, stay up here to answer any questions after eight o'clock. And again, if any of you have any stories you would like to share, we would love to hear your perspective from all different aspects of this, you know, if you knew city council members, anything. Um, both, again, Eric and Arlo will be staying after to take oral histories. Hi, my name is Isabel Anderson. Um, I am actually a, a senior. I'm graduating in 24 days. <laughs> Woo! From Stevens High School, and I actually live I live four minutes, two miles away from Stevens, so I live right above that main street line. And right yes, that's Hi. my neighborhood. And almost everyone I know, you know, a lot of my friends, some live way, way out, but my grandparents live on Highway uh, 44. I know people who live on Skyline. I, I, and I had no, I'm 18 years old. Like, I'm, I'm an adult. I, <laughs> I would consider myself someone who's, well, <laughs> someone who who is should know things, and obviously not everything, but <laughs> and I I had no idea. I I came here. I read part of the thing in the 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 journal today, and I uh, my grandmother and my grandfather asked me to take notes, so I did. But I, as I was listening to this, I had no idea. This is my neighborhood, and this is where I come from. But this is like I, my question is, what can I do like I'll be leaving Stevens, but like I have kids, I have friends who are younger than me, and I, yeah, I'm a part of. I don't know. I just want to know what I can do as part of as a young person. I don't. I'm, I don't know if I'm the youngest person in this room, <laughs> but I may be. I, I just want to know that. Like I just see that glowing dot on the map, and I it was just like I had no idea that I was a part of that, and that I was. Uh, but I want to do something as like the youth to. <laughs> to to be a part of the conversation and to be a part of the people who are like hey like yeah this is like there's this past but like what can i do to change great that question. great question well first of all who's over 18 and still learn new information tonight <laughs> so i think you're in good company <laughs> um well it's such a good question and i think you pinpointed one thing like stevens alone i think there's a doesn't realize that it's on Indian boarding school land and that Stevens has that really important history. So one of the most important things you can do is make sure your peers understand this history and that these stories are taught, these books are read in the high school. But also, as a young person, appreciate all of our stories, right? We all bring amazing perspectives, whether we came as pioneers from Europe, all of our families, we all share one thing in common. We love living in the Black Hills. Right? We love it. We are so blessed to all be here. So I know there's more questions, and I apologize, but we did promise at 8 p.m. Let's all count our blessings to be residents of the Black Hills, to share these interesting stories with each other, to continue to have this conversation. We will redo this presentation in two weeks for those that were not able to make it tonight. And as the mayor pointed out early on, this is just the beginning of the conversation, not the end. So thank you for taking time out from your families and for your lives for being here tonight. We really appreciate you.
We want to hear from one more elder, Sharon Lazat is a Sioux addition. Okay. Before Sharon speaks, I just I just have a very quick thing to say, and that is that um, we're starting a youth ambassador program. I want to uh, res respond to Izzy, so there'll be work happening. Please go check out our website, moarapidcity.org. We're going to keep you posted on new things that are happening, and uh, if you signed up, we'll try to stay in touch with you. So to Sharon. My name is, uh, my mother was Cecilia Montgomery. I don't know how many people know her, but she was very active in the community. Um, I'm, I guess there's some of us that lived in that Indian camp, they call it, but they didn't call it Indian camp, they call it Indian camp. And um, we lived there as children. I was talking to my friend here. She's one of the survivors too. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still living out to Sioux Edition where they took that shack. It's a different house now, but I survived that too. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, sitting here listening to all of this, I looked at my friend who came up with me through the ranks and all of these other families that lived down the Indian camp and still hung in there. I said, are you experiencing that historical grief? Because that's what's happening to us sitting here is that we're hurting remembering that. And you know, when you really think about it, we don't have anything to hurt about because as children, you know, we had, um, we had Donna Beagle do her homeless presentation at the Civic Center. And when I took her training, I said, poverty is a relative situation. Because as Native Americans, we lived out on the plains and nobody labeled us poverty living in teepees, chasing buffaloes, you know? So poverty is a relative situation. We were, we were the happiest kids down there. We had the whole rapid creek to play with. We had all those hills to climb up there, M Hill and all that. So to us, as long as we had our mother's love at night and something to eat, we didn't know we were poor and pitiful and everything. So, you know, we learned to live with that and we learned to work through it. So that's the human part of it. We're still here. <laughs> Great, thank you guys so much. Please travel safely home. <laughs>